Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and this is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. Recently, I was thinking to myself that COVID vaccine misinformation is starting to slow down, and soon I will be primarily making videos about other types of scientific misinformation. Looks like I thought too soon. Anti-vaxxers seem never to run out of studies that they can use to misrepresent the effects of COVID vaccination. The latest is a study out of Switzerland looking at myocardial injury after vaccination. And as usual, Dr. John Campbell has jumped on the bandwagon and ensured that the misinformation reaches as many people as possible. Let's have a look. Um, is myocardial injury, which has sometimes no symptoms uh, or sometimes minimal symptoms. It's oligosymptomatic. But that doesn't mean to say there can't be quite severe severe uh, consequences. In fact, just before we go on, I think I'll just tell you something about the potential severe consequences. Now, this is from um, the textbook of medicine that's used, been used for generations now. Um, I just want to read something from this. Um, in most patients, this is talking about myocarditis. In most patients, the disease is self-limiting and the immediate prognosis is excellent. However, death may occur due to ventricular arrhythmia or rapid progressive heart failure. Myocarditis has been reported as a cause of sudden and unexpected death in young athletes. And we could go on and read about longer term complications not my words directly from david's principles and practice of uh, medicine now this book is called profile of a criminal mind just before we go on i'll read a bit for you how is it that some people become criminals while the majority do not when the same temptations face all of us why do certain individuals succumb while others keep to the narrow path of righteousness and we could go on and learn more about why some people choose to use their skills for evil instead of good, but this video isn't about that, so it would be silly to continue, just like it's a bit silly for John to be reading a passage about myocarditis when his video is about a study where they didn't actually find any definitive cases of myocarditis. So this is a study here, and what they found in this study was that 2.8% of the healthcare workers who received the Moderna booster vaccine in the study had elevated levels of high sensitive troponin T in their blood that couldn't be explained by other causes. Troponin T is an enzyme found in cardiac muscle that can leak into the blood after stress or injury to the heart. Now, if you're wondering how many had elevated levels prior to getting a booster shot, we don't know because it wasn't measured. Although in a healthy population, 1% of people will have levels that are considered elevated by the definition. What we do know is that the elevated troponin levels were mild and transient, with all but one person seeing the levels reduce on day four. And just to put the numbers in perspective, the ruling criteria for a heart attack is a level greater than 52 nanograms per litre. Below that, you continue to observe and see what happens. The highest level in the study was 35 nanograms per litre. We also know that no one with elevated troponin T levels had abnormal ECG findings. And ECG is the same as EKG. ECG is an abbreviation of electrocardiogram. And EKG is an abbreviation of the German spelling of electrocardiogram, and for some reason in the US, they use that instead of ECG. As I said, there were no definitive cases of myocarditis in the study group of 777 people. There were two people meeting the criteria for probable myocarditis, but in one case, the troponin T level was only 9 nanograms per litre. And the cutoff that they used in this study was 8.9 nanograms per litre, which is only 0.1 nanograms per litre lower. Usually the accepted cutoff is 
14 nanograms per litre, but in this study they used a lower value for women. This increased the number of people above the cutoff from 14 to 22. But back to John's claims about myocarditis. Although there were no definitive cases in this study, myocarditis is a recognised side effect of mRNA vaccines and also some non-mRNA vaccines. Is the passage that he read from the medical textbook relevant in these cases? Not really. In this study, they compared the outcomes of three cohorts of myocarditis patients aged 12 years and over who were admitted to hospital. The three cohorts were people who got myocarditis within 28 days of a positive test for COVID, people who got myocarditis within 28 days of a COVID vaccine, and people who got myocarditis who didn't fit the other two categories. And in each case, they looked at 90 days of follow-up from admission to hospital. This is what they found. Compared with conventional myocarditis, people who got myocarditis after vaccination had a significantly reduced chance of heart failure or death. The relative risk for heart failure was 0.56 and the relative risk for death was 0.48. In contrast, people who got myocarditis after a positive COVID test were more likely to suffer heart failure and more likely to die with a relative risk of 1.48 for heart failure and 2.35 for death. Although the confidence interval for heart failure includes one, so that's not statistically significant. Now, it's important to know that this study was looking at the incidence of heart failure and death in the 90 days after hospital admission for myocarditis, but they didn't establish causality. So some of the events will be incidental because there is a baseline rate of heart failure and death across the whole population. But essentially, the study is showing that the rare cases of myocarditis that occur following vaccination have a better clinical outcome than cases following COVID or from other causes. Um, mRNA-1273 vaccine-associated myocardial injury was adjudicated in 22 participants, 2.8%. Dear me, if, if someone said to me, look, you could have had this vaccine, as I did. Uh, oh, but by the way, there's a 2.8% chance you'll have a, a vaccine-associated myocardial injury. I would have run a mile. Funnily enough, if John had run a mile, he quite likely would have ended up with elevated troponin levels, which is the definition of myocardial injury in this study. And by the way, I stole that line from Dr. Jonathan Laxton, who is an MD who actually sees cardiac patients. And he has also made a video about Dr. John Campbell's misrepresentation of the paper. Raised troponin levels following exercise are common and well reported in the literature. This is one of many papers looking at it. In fact, after running a marathon, only 37% of people have cardiac troponin levels in the normal range. 3% had levels more than 10 times the upper reference limit. And it's not just marathon running. In this study, they looked at cardiac troponin T levels in healthy adults and children before and after playing a game of football seven, which is football with seven players aside. And when I say football, I mean the game played by the mighty Manchester United, which is known as soccer, played with a ball like this in some countries. Cardiac troponin T was elevated in all players three hours after the game, and in 70% of them, it exceeded the upper reference limit. So that's football. What about swimming? In this study, they looked at troponin T levels before and after one hour of swimming in male and female adolescents and adults. In this case, the upper reference limit for troponin T was exceeded in 62% of participants. 
And there are many, many more studies showing that cardiac troponin levels exceed the upper reference limit in the majority of individuals following exercise. But no one would suggest that you shouldn't exercise. And it's not just exercise either. This study of 199 healthy pregnant women found that cardiac troponin levels were increased following birth in 55% of women. And in three women, they were higher than the cutoff value of 14 nanograms per litre. And remember, in the post-vaccine study, they used a lower cutoff of 8.9 nanograms per litre. And what about COVID? Could that increase your cardiac troponin levels? Absolutely. This meta-analysis looked at 43 studies that assessed cardiac injury from COVID and generally cardiac injury was defined as an increase in cardiac biomarkers as with the post-vaccination study. They found that the pooled prevalence of cardiac injury was 19% in all COVID patients, 36% in severe COVID patients and 48% in non-survivors. And all people were unvaccinated because no COVID vaccines were available when the study was done. So a 2.8 chance from the vaccine or a 19% chance from COVID. And in this study here, they looked at troponin T levels in healthy children with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infections who didn't have any comorbidities, obviously, because they're healthy and also hadn't been diagnosed with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which can occur in children who get COVID. They found elevated troponin T levels in 7% of patients, and they also found that troponin T positivity was significantly higher in patients under the age of 12 months, and troponin T levels were negatively correlated with age. But as the authors rightly pointed out, routine troponin screening does not yield much information in previously healthy paediatric COVID-19 patients without any sign of myocardial dysfunction. Elevated troponin levels may be observed, but it is mostly a sign of myocardial injury without detectable myocardial dysfunction in this group of patients. In layman's terms, Raised troponin levels without detectable myocardial dysfunction is no big deal. You've elevated on day three, there were warning, and they knew not to go exercising. And as a result of this, well, we can't say as a result of this, but thankfully we can say no major adverse cardiac events are in 30 days. So because, um, well, we don't know why, but certainly it's possible that these would have occurred if the patients hadn't been warned. Um, no major adverse events following 30-day follow-up. So there was no cardiac arrests, excellent. Uh, no uh, acute myocardial infarctions, no acute heart failure, no life-threatening arrhythmias. But these patients had been warned that their troponins were increased, indicating they had myocardial damage, so they knew not to exercise. They were looked after by a doctor, now, John appears to be trying to subtly suggest here that the reason these patients didn't have bad outcomes was because they were warned not to exercise after being told that their troponins were elevated on day three. But this doesn't really make any sense because most people don't have their troponins checked after vaccination. But a large number of studies have shown that there isn't an increase in cardiac events beyond myocarditis and pericarditis following mRNA vaccinations. For example, in this study here, they compared people in Israel who had received the Pfizer mRNA vaccine with people who had been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And what they found was an absolute risk of myocarditis in people who had received the vaccine of 2.7 per 100,000. But in people who were infected with SARS-CoV-2, it was 11 per 100,000. They also looked at other serious outcomes, including cardiac arrhythmia, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction, 
and intracranial hemorrhage. And there was no increase in any of these outcomes following vaccination. But there was following COVID. Now, of course, you can't know in advance if you will get myocarditis following COVID mRNA vaccination. So it is best to take a cautious approach and avoid strenuous exercise for a few days afterwards. Likewise, you should do the same following any viral illness. We've been treated like mushrooms on this and it's completely unacceptable. It's just, it's just, anyway, we'll leave that point there. Yes, John is again treating his viewers like mushrooms. As a former nurse educator, he should know that elevated troponin levels without detectable myocardial dysfunction is not a cause for concern. Let's hope some of his viewers will see this video and know that he's just misrepresenting the study for profit. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. She's been, she had a few treats while we were making the video actually. And we really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.